Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jan King and uh, W3GUI and VK4GUI, and I'm speaking to you this morning from uh, near Noosa, Queensland, Australia, so a little further away than some of you have been. And um, today I wanted to talk about future projects and fun we can do with millimeter wave communications and particularly when I say millimeter wave I'm referring to frequency bands really between about 10 and about 50 gigahertz uh, because those are the practical bands that we can do. I realize some of us in the audience have actually been wandering around up as high as 100, uh, 100 gigahertz but uh, we're particularly going to focus on three ITU bands that the amateur radio service and the amateur satellite service have allocated to them. And uh, I think they're ones that uh, we should start really working on and having fun with as soon as possible. So I apologize for not being able to be live on this, but um, just the way we have to do it these days, I guess. So, Future fun with millimeter wave communications. So the two services, amateur radio service and amateur satellite service, and they're considered to be kind of the same thing, but in two different regimes. Um, there are three frequency allocations. Uh, and as we go up in frequency, they're of higher and higher quality to us, uh, but maybe in some ways, given where we are in time, uh, history, uh, they're maybe a little less useful to us as we go up in, in, in to a higher and higher radio spectrum. But we have two bands, uh, 10 and 24, that are 50 megs wide, and then one at, uh, at uh, 47 gigahertz, which I think is the jewel in the crown for us all. If you imagine we have four megahertz of spectrum that we have available to us in the two meter band, which uh, those of you who are radio amateurs know is very, very heavily used around the world and is very popular. Uh, imagine that up at 47 gigahertz, we have 200 megahertz of spectrum. So think of what we could in fact actually do in terms of moving data with uh, such an awesome amount of spectrum. When you look at the table, 47 to 47.2 doesn't seem like very much spectrum. It's only a, a small fraction of the uh, absolute frequency, but actually 200 megahertz is uh, awesome. Um, the, an important thing to point out is we now have, well, one of the reasons we haven't been using these bands in larger numbers of people is because only specialists who are really very excited about using microwave communications have uh, ventured into the process here because working with equipment is a lot harder to do and it hasn't been really available. But now it, it really is quite available and it's getting more so, and for one particular reason, um, which um, I realize I wanted to talk more about in this talk than um, I have planned to, is that we should all, in some ways, perhaps we don't think of cellular radio as our, cellular telephony as our best friend, but actually in terms of the technology that's being generated 5G cellular technology is our best friend because all these devices around the world are becoming available because of the investment in those frequency bands. But I wanted to talk about the characteristics of these bands too, and um, point out that uh, the similarities between the higher particularly the 24 and 47 gigahertz band, maybe more like HF communications than you've been thinking in the past. On these low frequencies, we've always had the vagaries of what's happening with the ionospheric layers. And uh, when the band is open, it's open and it's only open to some direction in which uh, one of the layers is, uh, is uh, forming or uh, 
in the process of forming is formed or is in the process of, of degenerating. So we, we, we go with those vagaries and it's part of the fun. So it's the ionosphere that rules at HF, whereas at SHF or millimeter wave, depending on which, how you'd like to talk about it, uh, the atmosphere rules and particularly the weather rules. And particularly uh, in, most, in most of the bands we're talking about today, it's, it's, it's rain or water that causes the problem and the fun. And, and so water from the atmosphere absorbs RF. It, sums, it does it somewhat selectively uh, due to the quantum mechanics of, of the various molecules of uh, nitrogen, oxygen, and water, carbon dioxide that exist within the atmosphere. They, they absorb energy in different ways. And it's uh, primarily the quantum numbers associated with the rotations of the molecules that absorb the RF energy. So um, in the case of the millimeter wave frequencies, it's where you live that matters and how wet it is where you live that really matters. Uh, but this really could be a lot of fun. Uh, imagine being able to not just say, what the weather's like, but really quantify the weather by how, how well you hear, hear, say, a satellite signals or a beacon signal uh, that's uh, located some reasonable distance away. Uh, so you can really quantify things. It's, uh, it's a lot like having a weather radar that you probably look at on your cell phone. So uh, some things uh, <laughs> we, can't, we can't beat, but still uh, quantifying the weather uh, for yourself is really kind of a cool idea. Um, but before we can play in these games, we've got to first pay, <laughs> as it were. And when I mean pay, we mean we need we've got some work to do. Uh, we need to figure out how we're going to share the radio spectrum with others, and we'll talk about that in the next few slides. But we also need to do a bit of research. So how can we share with other services? Uh, at 10 and 24 gigahertz is particularly important because those two bands are going to be the most important ones uh, to start with. And then we'll, we'll phase into 47, I, I would forecast, uh, because that's uh, a little bit harder because of the high, high propagation losses, excess path losses that you get. Um, we need to determine uh, of these three bands, which we're going to have uh, at our disposal, what should be used for an uplink and a downlink if we're using satellites. Um, also, there's probably some interesting uh, modulation and encoding and things like that that will, would, will have to be sorted through four terrestrial modes as well. Um, and what's the device technology status at 24 and 47? It's changing daily. Uh, I would say that about every three months, uh, new parts are coming on, on the market from 5G cellular primarily, but that will cover these, the frequency range that is associated with, with these two bands. And um, gallium nitride in particular as a, as a power technology is, uh, is increasing so fast that we will be at several watts of power uh, by the time we get into this very far. Uh, so device efficiencies and device uh, frequency range ranges are, are, are ever, ever trending upward. Um, the, the other thing is how bad are the exit path losses at 24 and 47 gigahertz? And we're gonna talk about about that a bit, but we still need to characterize that on a local level. So wherever you're located, uh, you'll need to know, and you will learn about that. It's the basic thing you'll be a lot smarter about is the excess path loss uh, on these two frequency bands once you get a rig that would uh, be able to support those frequencies. And then uh, because these are such wide bands, we can talk about enhancing signals by doing things like spectrum spreading, and forward error correction coding. And those aren't nice things to do at millimeter wave. They're essential things to do, as you'll see. Um, and then what's the easiest way to make cheap radios? That's what radio amateurs are really good at. And we would expect that if we can 
provide the technology to build ground stations or terrestrial stations. And we uh, also have the wherewithal to provide satellite support for those stations by building our own small and cheap satellites too, then <clears throat> we'll have, have the necessary ingredients to have radio amateurs do what they do best. And that is synthesize low cost technologies that are appropriate for everybody to use. And that's what we want to do. Okay, now, uh, some of the more ugly stuff. Um, this is where we're really paying, <laughs> paying, paying for things here. Uh, and and that is so we need to understand the radio spectrum. This this is from the uh, ITU table of frequency allocations. It's from a U.S. government version because you see on the left at the top is the international part of the table, which has regions, IT regions one, two, and three. And what we see is that what the US is doing with that, and there's, you may know the US uniquely has both a government and a non-government side, each controlled by a separate agency, the federal government's controlled by the NTIA and the, and the non-federal part like us is controlled by, of course, the FCC. But when you look at these tables, you'll, you'll notice that the nice thing is that we have amateur radio worldwide in all three regions uh, in this 10 gigahertz band, which is in a way we've already been using it. There's already a couple of satellites, including uh, uh, Oscar 100, which is a, is a geo spacecraft that uh, uses the 10 gigahertz band, I believe. Um, but uh, it is only given to us on a secondary basis, both amateur and amateur satellite. But you'll see, in addition to these assignments or allocations uh, in the regions, you'll see that there are some funny little numbers at the bottom of, the, of, this, of this table. And those are, of course, footnotes. And the footnotes are both national and international. I think you can look at it and see which are uh, the, the numbered ones are, of course, international. And then where it says US 128, that's clearly national. And G means non-government. So that's US non-government. But we have to look at the footnotes because they're, they, have the they are completely as important as the other entries into the table. And the important thing here is to look at, I think, the 5.481. Uh, this is sometimes called a Me Too, and as Michelle and I laughed yesterday, when you see a Me Too footnote where lots of countries are listed, the first country listed is, is non-alphabetical, you notice, notice it's Germany. So it means Germany created this footnote, and then everything else is in alphabetical order. Those are the Me Too's, those are the guys that jumped on the footnote during a world radio conference and said, we'd like to do this as well. And then it becomes a law and 5.481 is the law. And what you'll notice here, uh, I underlined uh, the last part because it says that these, uh, this spectrum is allocated to these countries for fixed and mobile use. Now that's pretty broad and it's pretty, in, it means it's pretty intense telecommunications services. The mobile could even be cellular, although I don't think this band is used anywhere in the world for cellular. It's some kind of mobile service, and it's on a primary basis. So what that means is that in these countries, this band to amateur radio is secondary to all these primary uh, mobile and fixed services that are being talked about here. And um, that really is a potential problem. What it really means is that these countries listed probably don't have amateur radio in the domestic table. Uh, if, if you looked at their domestic table uh, of frequencies, they don't assign amateur radio. Most of these countries will not assign amateur radio at all in that frequency band. So when we launch a satellite, let's say, to support this frequency band, 
we have to realize that these countries are countries that won't be allowed to communicate through that device. Um, another interesting point here is that th there are other priorities implied by the footnotes in the NG51 at the bottom is telling us that we're actually higher ranking while we may what may be much lower than the the the, the people who have assigned on to the 4.58 uh 5.481 we're higher than a certain class of non-government users who are using radar in this band that's that's the uh, the radio location uh in capital letters within the table but for non-government users in the US, we have priority over them. So <laughs> it's kind of a mish mishmash, but it shows you how complex uh, frequency assignments can be and why you need to read the little numbers at the bottom of the table when you're looking at this and sorting out what, what it may mean to you. Uh, if we go up to the next band, we see we have 50 megahertz and we've, we've improved our conditions considerably. We're now uh, uh, co-primary with our cells, meaning amateur and amateur satellites share the band. And if you just look at this, it, it looks like, ah, uh, we're the only people in the band, except there's that funny little number at the bottom again. So we have to go look up 5.150. And when we do, we see that a, a bunch of bands are influenced, including this one, by the fact that, uh, those are also set aside for industrial, scientific, and medical. Uh, forget about those that terminology and just think Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and anything else that makes a lot of racket in the in the two gigahertz band. You'll see that uh, our our S band frequency twenty four hundred to twenty four seventeen is us uh, is within that twenty four twenty five. 100 band, and of course we know what's happening in that frequency band. It is full to the brim with Wi-Fi, and everybody everywhere is using it for connecting their computer to devices all around the house. So um, 24 gig could become like that, and if that's the case, then we can say that for long-range use, terrestrially and satellite use. We want to be away from uh, population centers when we set up our stations, if possible. And if not possible, expect to find little holes in the band you can use because there. Once this gets going, it's going to help. It's going to suffer the same fate that uh, uh, that uh, our current S band allocation has uh, for amateur radios use. And then um, there was a there was another footnote that was also in the U.S. part, and uh, this one is also important in the 2400 gig band, and it it defines a rationale for how we might use the band, um, and in what direction we might use the band, and also uh, I, this comment applies to the prior comments about the fact that we're using it. Uh, for, we'll be using it for Wi-Fi and other uh, very short range, but intense, uh, intense use uh, telecommunications. So with this footnote, we see that we have to protect, protect the adjacent frequency band from this, that the radio astronomers will be using. And they're putting a footnote in there to remind us. They put lots of reminder footnotes in the, in the uh, ITU table of allocations and the, the uh, radio astronomers are very good at that. So th the best way for us to protect radio astronomy would be if when we're transmitting, we don't transmit with something that's up in the air like an aircraft or balloon or a spacecraft because that causes radio astronomers, of course, a lot more difficulty if they're trying to discriminate between something that's up in the sky, which is their home after all, all their antennas are pointed up in the sky. So it's better if we were to transmit from the ground where there's lots of things that absorb signals on the ground and good chance we're gonna be far away from a radio astronomy site, whereas a satellite is gonna be a lot of the time in view of radio astronomy sites. This is all saying that 
between those two footnotes, it, it's best if we use this band as an uplink band because it will cause the radio astronomers less grief and uh, also the interference that we might receive from something like Wi-Fi stations uh, won't, won't matter. The spacecraft can see the sum of all the Wi-Fi users, but it's easier to make use of it uh, uh, by just overwhelming the, the signal from all the Wi-Fis up at the satellite than, than it would be to use it as, as a downlink. So this is naturally, these footnotes are telling us like big red flag, this band should be an uplink band. And then there's the jewel in the crown. It's an exclusive band at 47 to 47.2 for amateur and amateur satellite. Like I say, there's no other band like this in the radio spectrum that I know of except two meters uh, where we don't share with anyone. It's exclusive primary, there's no footnotes. Um, there's no sharing with anything else. Any, or anything or anyone else in its 200 megahertz of spectrum. But it's also a red flag to the bull and the bull being 5G cellular in this case, come get me. <laughs> Let's uh, realize that it, it, it's uh, sitting there and we're not using it much and we better start using it. Otherwise there will be footnotes and those footnotes will not be in our interest anymore. Okay. So we've, we've talked about the, the nastiness of uh, spectrum management here with respect to these bands. Now, I think uh, another fun thing to look at is how, how are these bands different than what we've done in the past and how we've used radio spectrum and how we've used, uh, how we built our radios in the past. Well, the first thing to look at is, um, for each of these frequency bands, how hard is it to actually uh, get a signal from one point to another? Um, I took from a list that I've been creating over a long time, the, the wettest and driest and most intermediate places uh, that I can find on the earth. And if, if you look in our, uh, in ITU region two, there's probably just about no wetter place in that part of the world than New Orleans. Uh, there are wetter places in Africa, but this is pretty bad. So if you look at wet being bad in the case of the absorption of RF energy, then this is the condition, this is what you would see if you had a satellite uh, and you were passing a signal from that satellite in either direction, you could be transmitting to it or, or receiving it, but it's passing through the atmosphere at an elevation angle to, this, to the earth station or the receiving station anyway, at 10 degrees elevation. And I'm using a one meter diameter dish. You notice we're only talking about the, the absorption here, the local excess path uh, attenuation that we get in the signal. So you'd say, well, why does the size of the dish matter? Well, uh, the ITU, when it figures all the, all the problems that cause absorption, it considers one called scintillation. And scintillation is a rapid, uh, rapid variation in the signal strength. And the ITU decided it's just gonna pretend that that's like a loss. If you have 2 dB of variation in the signal strength, it assumes that that variation can be applied as a loss to the signal. And uh, because this variation is occurring in the atmosphere itself, the, the larger the collecting device um, that's receiving it, the bigger the aperture of the antenna, the more scintillation energy is collected. So when it calculates the amount of scintillation to add in here, so th th that's another point to make here, and that is that I'm using for this these tables, you'll see the ITU P618 RAIN model. It happens to be revision six, if that's of interest. They're up to revision nine, I think now, or something like that. But anyway, this is, this is from the ITU, and it calculates the effects of the atmosphere, rain, 
if there is, is any uh, carb, uh, other gas absorption like carbon dioxide, it would calculate that and scintillation losses. It, it also uh, accounts for uh, water absorption differently between clouds and just normal water sus suspended in the air and then rain itself. So each of those is considered a separate category. So this is the sum of all those categories at the different frequency bands at a wet location. A dry location, you may not, you may thought a, a desert was drier, but actually uh, places close to the poles, Antarctica particularly, and, and uh, in this case, uh, since there's a big ground station at Svalbard, uh, it's, uh, it's a good reference because they, the, these are measurement, these observations have been carefully documented and uh, uh, collaborated. And then um, I pick Boulder, Colorado is the moderate location because the, the rain there is moderate, but more, more than that, it's one of the most measured places on the planet when it comes to meteorology, as many will know. So what you see is that at 10 gigahertz, uh, there's not too much difference. We really haven't gotten to the point where water is becoming totally substantial, but we are getting at 10 gigahertz a averaged about a dB over all these uh, locations, uh, we're getting a dB of extra path loss in addition to the one over R squared path loss you get, you always get no matter where you are. Uh, if we go up to the 24 gig band, uh, the 24 gigs is actually on a slight local peak in the water vapor absorption. There is actually a, a, a resonance phenomenon occurring in a water vapor molecule that uh, the response at 24 gigahertz, it's not huge, but it's big enough to take, uh, take New Orleans from one and a half dB up to about nine dB. Uh, and this is, uh, this, is uh, this by the way, is uh, under conditions where there's no rain. This, is, this particular snapshot is not with rain, but just, uh, just is a normal atmosphere conditions and scintillation. So we're going to look, we're going to turn on the rain here in a minute, but uh, this is with the rain off. Uh, then uh, Boulder, Colorado, the, the moderate case, you can see an in between case of 5.8 uh, dB of absorption. Sadly, when we go up to 47 gigahertz, the band we'd like to most use in a way because it's ours. Uh, and the reason it's ours is because nobody else wanted to deal with this stuff. So they said, oh, the hams will do this. We'll, we'll give it to them. So anyway, so we, we've got a wet case of uh, 11 dB for New Orleans. And uh, you can, it's not too different uh, at that frequency between Svalbard and Boulder. But uh, it, it sure is going to hit us hard at uh, any place in the world where it's wet. Now... What happens if we turn on the rain? Same conditions, 10 degree elevation angle, uh, path between a satellite and the ground, one meter dish. And now we see that with 99% rain conditions, uh, the, the, um, with 99% rain conditions, the, um, absorption has gone up significantly at New Orleans up to 3 dB at 10 gigs. But heavens, if we look at 47 megahertz, uh, if ever there was a brick wall, 81.7 dB is such a brick wall. What that means is somebody in New Orleans can't talk across the block, let alone out to space. <laughs> um, and in the drier cases, uh, it uh, 14 dB of loss we can actually overcome uh, at 47 gigahertz, and, and you can see that the rain doesn't matter too much at 10 gigahertz. In the modern case for Boulder, 26.9 dB at 47 gigahertz isn't a total deal killer, but what it would mean is that if you had a one watt transmitter and were able to communicate with the rain off, you would be you would have to have about a 500 watt transmitter uh, to be able to transmit with uh, the rain on. So that's a pretty, pretty big hill to climb. 
to say the least. By the way, you can not only increase your power here, you could also increase your antenna gain. So if you wanted to make yourself a four meter dish or something like that and, and do this, it, uh, it'd be a little bit difficult to point because it would be under 0.1 degree beam width, but on the other hand, that would help you reduce your power. Okay, so what we know is that if we have the rain on uh, in, for these frequency bands, uh, it, it gets pretty dire. Uh, even at 24 gigahertz, it's getting pretty dire. Uh, but one thing we can do to improve things is if we do have a satellite, we can move the satellite up in the sky for the case of our analysis. So, so let's assume we now have a spacecraft, which is, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit, but not much about orbits at all today. But we're going to put this spacecraft in an orbit that's pretty far out there. It's going to be out as far as a geostationary satellite. And at its, at it's, it's, it's going to be in an orbit that comes close to the Earth, but most of the time it's going to hang out near the apogee of the orbit. And when it's out there, um, the Earth's going to rotate under it. So sometimes you're going to have really good elevation angles. And what if you did have a 70 degree elevation angle and a spacecraft hanging out there? Well, this is what you have. Uh, you see that New Orleans is now at 47 gigs, about where uh, where Boulder was uh, in the in the prior prior slide. It's just about off the chart, but it isn't. It's it's hugely challenging, but it's something that could be done. So so 26 dB of absorption is with the rain on and. Uh, you can see we lose about nine and a half dB at 24 gigs and 10 gigs is still not a problem for us. Um, but it's, it's not entirely undoable. And what we can also say is, well, 90, uh, this, uh, this condition is only going to last 1% of the time and 99% of the time it's going to be better than that. So what it says is that for, for a wet place like New Orleans, 47 gigahertz at high elevation angles is gonna be a really fun weather monitoring system. You can really tell how bad the weather is by just listening to how weak a beacon would be from a spacecraft or a distant, uh, a distant uh, mountaintop, say. But uh, it shows that there's a lot of fun to be had by uh, learning about weather here. Uh, at Svalbard, we see that uh, at seven degrees, Pretty much, we don't have to worry in a, in a very dry place uh, about the spectrum as the elevation angle gets higher. And for Boulder, it's more of a challenge at 47 gigs, but um, it's kind of an in-between case. He, uh, a, a guy transmitting from Boulder would have to increase his power output by about a factor of 10, just a little under a factor of 10 in order to play in the game even at uh, even during 99% rain conditions. Um, so how could we best use these bands given, given these uh, various absorption characteristics and given the bunch of footnotes we had? Um, so satellites typically relay signals between two locations on the Earth. That's hopefully easy to understand. Uh, and in doing that, they commonly have some kind of uh, electronic repeating device. So there's an uplink frequency and a downlink frequency channel. And, and so that the downlink doesn't interfere with the uplink, typically these two frequency bands are uh, different in frequency from one another, usually by about at least 10%, sometimes as much as 50%, but quite different from one another. So we can use filtering to filter the uh, the uh, downlink signal uh, and make sure that none of that energy gets into the uplink band because there's probably 160, 170 dB difference between the levels of those two signals. Um, and we take into account here that amateur radio as it's, it's evolved in our society radio amateurs have always wanted to listen to another signal even more than they really need to talk back to that source. 
So the whole idea of shortwave listening was the first case where people used to listen to signals uh, before radio amateurs, before they became radio amateurs, got hooked on the hobby because they were listening to signals and they said, oh, I'd like to do that too. So uh, because of that, we want to make sure that the downlink is always more uh, more accessible to us than, than the uplink is, which says that we want to be able to make sure the downlink is, is, um, is the easiest thing uh, about a radio system to, uh, to hear or, or to listen to. Some people would say to, uh, a lot of people don't listen anymore with their ears. So we're talking about data, data streams. So you wanna make sure that you're, you're locked to the carrier and to the, and to the modulation code. Uh, most of the time on the downlink and then, then we'll talk about the uplink after we're sure we can hear the downlink. Um, so we want, again, in summary, we want satellite links to change little over time and, become, and be as easy as possible to receive. That if we look again at the bands and we start thinking about that in terms of that 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 criterion and, and the other criteria we, we discussed, the 10.5 gig band has less rain and atmospheric loss, and uh, it's also the uh, has a more mature technology base. It's a lower frequency, so devices have been around for a longer time for 10 gigahertz. And so it just makes sense that we use this band for a downlink. And uh, what else do I want to say here? Uh, it would it would make it easier for uh, people entering into this world of telecommunications beginners to uh, be able to receive a signal before they. Uh, Mount the challenge of having to transmit a signal. Um, the 24 gigahertz band, we talked about it uh, a little bit already, uh, is uh, we've got to protect the radio astronomers. And we also have Wi Fi in that band, or all manner of different signals, including Wi Fi, are going to appear. And things that haven't yet been invented are going to appear in that band. So for that reason, uh, where there's going to be a high local interference level and you can't protect against it. We've tried many times to make that work at S band at 2.4 gigahertz, and we've been very unsuccessful. There's always local interference uh, and it can't be eliminated. It's coming in the side bands of even very directive antennas. So the, that all points to the fact that uh, 24 it is a natural uplink band, and we should be thinking about that as we move forward, at least for satellite use. Um, if, it, if you're using it for terrestrial use, there are problems that can't be overcome because of Wi-Fi. It probably means for terrestrial use, you're going to have to move away from places where computers are so that you can possibly communicate with somebody else. Um, the 47 gigahertz band, while um, really hammered by excess path loss, is really our gem to be polished. And we don't have to share it with anybody. And so it's extremely valuable spectrum. It's so valuable. Uh, so by all rights, this means we should make it a downlink band because if if, if we don't have any constraints and we don't have to protect other services, go for it. We should have it high up in the sky and, and, and downlink as much power as we can. Um, and with 200 megahertz, there's room to do anything any reasonable uh, person would like to do. Uh, uh, and it can experiment to heart, your heart's content. But all the losses that, uh, that exist in, in this frequency band, uh, excess path losses, as, as we've described, mean that there's a real burden for downlinking through this because the, the EIRP, effective isotropic radiated power from the satellite, is uh, uh, 
a difficult commodity to conjure up. It's hard to, to increase the Europe on satellites too much because of course we can't generate very much power up there. And uh, we're limited to the device efficiencies we can achieve. So it's hard to make a downlink uh, uh, work. Uh, and therefore the burden, putting the burden on the ground makes a lot of sense. So it, it, it does uh, suggest that uh, there are arguments for, in favor of it being a downlink and there are arguments in favor of it being an uplink. So that suggests maybe we should experiment with this band and try both methods and see what evolves from the process because we all know that something like a device we never would have expected might come along and it's a game changer. Uh, some uh, excess uh, equipment that is, is um, coming from say some big government project. We, we all have been involved in things where a piece of uh, surplus equipment comes up on the market and it's just what we needed for the project we were, were interested in. And if enough of that equipment becomes available, then, and a lot of people could benefit from it, then that's a game, that could be a game changer and it could drive whether this band would be used for up and down. But um, I think uh, one way or the other, we ought to try both methods and, and maybe more exper experimentally sort this band out and see what, see what happens. So if, we think of those in the way I suggested it, a, uh, for a spacecraft system, a, a transponder that evolves, might, a modern day transponder might look something like this. So the, we, if we uh, want to take 24 gigahertz as being our uplink uh, band for the reasons that have been described, then we could have a dual frequency receiver where we had a 47 gig uplink and a 24 gig. And we would probably for a spacecraft use something like a horn antenna. Um, don't want to go a lot into spacecraft technology here right now. Um, could, but I don't think we should. Uh, and what I would say is though, at the apogee of the uh, Earth, Earth at the apogee of an orbit like this, which is a, a geotransfer orbit is what we're proposing. Uh, you're at an altitude of about 36,000 kilometers. And at that altitude, the Earth's about 18, 19 degrees in size. And so the antenna you would want to match that beam with is somewhere between 17 and 22 dB. So all these antennas, if you want them to be Earth covered so everybody on the Earth could participate, then that's about the gain you want for these antennas. And then you have to make up the rest of the gain that you need uh, between the uplink and the downlink through, through the various uh, receiving and transmitting elements of the transponder. But anyway, we end up having dual frequency receiver and we, that would also include some down conversion. So we convert to some IF-ish channels. Uh, I'm just calling them here generically channel one and two that we go into a software defined radio or and in, in a specific example, the software defined radio that we might use would be some of the technology that's out there that uh, various vendors are putting forward called an RF silicon on chip device. So an RF sock and these things come in lots of flavors and lots of frequencies. A lot of them uh, will at least support IFs up to about six gigahertz. And I think even the crummiest ones are down around S-band, around two gigahertz. So you would have a couple of channels carrying us. And each of these channels, by the way, could contain multiple users. So um, you might call those sub-channels. So each, each user might be side by side in the spectrum. You might use TDMA, you might be, use code division multiple access. However you do the multiple user game, uh, it's done by this dual frequency receiver and converted to two data streams, channel one and channel two. Into the software defined radio amplification and demodulation and maybe even data storage. So you might have tied to this software defined radio a large uh, memory uh, where we could store um, minutes to hours, seconds to hours of data. And then we might play it back through the downlinks 
on channel one and two. Now the, the downlink uh, situation would be um, that we would have a downlink at 10.5 gigahertz, as we said. And for experimental purposes, we'd also put a downlink at 47 gigahertz. Now, uh, since we know we need a fair amount of separation between the uplink and the downlink, we already know that we might have a situation where the 47 gigahertz receive and transmit certainly can't be on the same frequency and be both on at the same time. That would be kind of bad juju. So we would either need to time multiplex these in some way or it either, either in a short term basis, like on the millisecond level, or we might do it by saying, well, right now we're gonna have the 47 gigahertz receiver on and an hour from now, we're gonna put the 47 gigahertz transmitter on. And then we'd have various modes between the uplinks and the downlinks we could support. But clearly we couldn't have both 47 gigahertz radios on at the same time. That wouldn't work. Um, I promised no, no real link budgets today. So if, if I promise not to give you a tutorial on link budget and I just summarize it in pictures with as few numbers as possible, this is what I come up with. So it, this is how, what, what's involved or how hard it is to come up with a transponder system like this that we might use to uh, have a lot of fun with with millimeter wave. Um, first of all, the satellite, we talk about the whole system. The satellite would be in a GTO-like orbit, so it has a perigee down and low. Maybe we take it up a little bit, so it's up around 1,000 kilometers, 1,200 kilometers, something like that. And then the apogee goes up to this magic number, which is the geo altitude. By the way, the way you catch a ride is to, is to ride with geo spacecraft, which exactly goes to this orbit already. All we'd be doing is getting off the geo bird or the, the platform attached to the GeoBird, uh, the upper stage of the, of the launch vehicle. And then we might have enough Delta V on board our little satellite to just increase the perigee a little bit. Doesn't take much uh, Delta V to do that. Uh, the transponder, as we said, would be in, uh, as shown here. Uh, the amount of ERP, I think you need is about 26.8. And if you realize that the uh, that the gain of the, of, of the antenna here is in the twenties of dB, you see, it get, gives you an idea that the, you need a few watts of power. I think the way I set it up was it it's it's ten watts of uh, RF power on the downlink. We'll see that in a minute. Um, and the user terminal is going to use a one meter dish, which I think is sort of optimum for all the fiddling around I've done with this stuff and uh, about a watt of power. So a, a meter and a watt is what you need to play this game. And by the way, the noise figure of the LNA I picked was about 2.5 dB. And that might actually be hard enough to do. You, you guys can tell me more than I can tell you about that. But I think that uh, that's uh, that's that's a pretty pretty hot front end for these frequencies. Um, so if we look at the numbers. Uh, what we end up with uh, is if we did a, if if each user sent a narrow band uplink, we assume the bandwidth for this emission is a narrow band one, and we have a whole bunch of narrow band transmissions from individual users to the spacecraft, and this is just one of those links. And what you see here is if I had a one watt transmitter and, and, and a one meter antenna, I'd have a pretty good ERP of, of four, uh, four point, uh, 44 dBW is uh, over, over 10,000. It's, it's more than 20,000 watts of effective isotropic radiated power, but it's all because of the antenna, of course. And we have to pass through the uh, atmosphere. We're going to have a clear sky case here. So the sun's out. We're just passing through the layers of the atmosphere there. And what happens is we end up with a signal, if we look at the upper part of this figure, where there's 
two measures of goodness that I've defined. Uh, C over N plus I means the carrier to noise plus interference ratio. It's the same as the signal to noise ratio. The I is just uh, noting that in addition to white noise, you may have other uh, forms of interference that you collect on the way up to the spacecraft. And so it accounts for that. And then the number I like is the C over N zero, C, C over N zero plus I zero. That's the signal to noise power density. Now don't glaze over on me here. Uh, noise power density, you have to think of this in a much simpler way. The C over N zero of a signal is the signal to noise ratio in a one hertz bandwidth. So let's, Let's say that again. It's the signal noise ratio. If the sig all of that all of that power that you were collecting is confined to one hertz. Another way of saying it is, if I had a one hertz filter and I could send this signal to the satellite, I'd have a signal to noise ratio in a one hertz bandwidth of forty five point nine dB. Um, with that signal, we then uh, are going to be using. Uh, some of the magic tricks that we will need to use for these frequency bands. Realizing the signals have such an extraordinarily high path loss, we're losing just due to one over uh, the distance squared, we're losing 212 dB on the way out to a geo altitude spacecraft. That 212 dB is hard to get back even with the gain, a uh, 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 gain on both ends of the link. So we've got about 20 some dB of gain in, in the satellite, and we've got like 40 some dB of gain on the ground station antenna. And that 60 dB com combined isn't enough to do the trick. We also need to make sure that we're transmitting, uh, we're, we're demodulating with the best possible uh, methodology we, we can. So we, we not, not only use forward error correction coding, we use forward error correction coding twice. Uh, and when we do that, the data rate we can get on this 10 kilohertz wide channel is about 15.6 kilobits per second. We use a, a data standard called digital video broadcasting. S2X is the second generation and an extension of the second generation. And we're able to use a modulation type of QPSK and a coding rate of nine tenths. And when we use that modulation and coding step, we're able to close the link at 15.6 kilobits per second, which is way more than you need for a voice channel and is pretty good for an awful lot of things you might like to do. And this remember is at the apogee of a geotype orbit and with only one watt of power at the ground. And uh, the link, because of things that are happening on the downlink, and we'll go into this in a minute, uh, the user channels that are supported uh, are as many as 143. So I kind of have 143 <laughs> users on this little satellite. Each one is uh, able to support uh, almost 16 kilobits per second. Um, now I turn on the rain for the same conditions and what you see, uh, all the numbers look pretty similar, except the outcome is that I've lost a fair amount of C over N plus I and um, my C over N zero plus I zero has, has dropped from 46 to about 39. And that slows my data rate down to about 6.9 kilobits per second. But from Boulder, Colorado, under rain conditions, I can still I can still get uh, almost seven kilobits per second, and I can support 129 similar stations uh, on this on this link in both uh, both link directions. Now, if we look at the downlink, we're we're down to 10 um, 10.5 gigahertz, and you see the path loss has gone down to about 205 dB, so it's a little less difficult to get the RF down. And that's why we put the downlink. That's one of the reasons we put the downlink here. Uh, and the excess path loss is also pretty low. It's only a dB. 
This is again for Boulder with the sun out. And in this case, uh, the ERP is 26.8 dBW and the power uh, the power is uh, is 10 watts, and the rest of that is antenna gain and some losses. So uh, that's already worth talking about a little bit because 10 watts of RF power at a, a little satellite's not so easy, really, because it means with the efficiencies of something like gallium nitride, we need about uh, 35 watts, 30 watts. Uh, and if we have some other radio equipment, we might need about 40 watts of RF of, of DC power to support that 10 watts of RF. So that's uh, not a totally unbelievably cheap satellite. We're probably talking the better part of a million dollars for a spacecraft like that in this day and age. And you know, you might need to pay another half a million to get a ride. So not totally cheap, but it's it's what we got to do to make this happen. Um, if we put the clouds in there, uh, oh, I didn't, I didn't give the results here. Uh, the uh, data rate we then achieved. Now, what we're doing is we're taking all of those users and we're providing a common downlink, which is shared by all the users. So all the users receive a wider band signal. Now, this, this signal is in a one megahertz bandwidth, and uh, it again uses DVBS2 and double coding, forward error correction coding. And if we, we do that, we, we can we get a slightly different mod cut step value here, and, but in a wider bandwidth. So we're getting about 900 kilobits per second with all the users and all the users have to share that data rate. So each user is put in little packets, one right after the other uh, within, within the frame of, uh, of the DBB system. And you have to pick your data out from everybody else's data and throw the rest away or you can use that data for other purposes of course depending on what we're doing with this system at the time but again uh 900 kilobits per second in, in the sun from boulder with uh with a, a modest one meter terminal and a, a noise figure two and a half db uh if i turn the rain on at boulder uh, for the downlink, the data rate slows down to uh, about one mod cut step and it goes down from 899 to 808. So about a 10% reduction in data rate. And that will still support about 129. My measure of goodness here, by the way, if you're wondering, is how, how many users should be able to be supported by a little satellite like this. I would have said about 100, but since uh, there are two people to share a communication, then that means 200 users uh, could be supported uh, was my goal. And you can see this, 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 this is the system. This system would support that. You see the, the excess path loss um, at uh, 10 gigs has only gone up uh, a little bit up to 1.4 dB. So, there wasn't that much difficulty in closing the link if we keep the downlink at 10 gigahertz, 10.5 gigahertz. So what can I do with a system like this? I tried to think of a lot of fun things we could do. So of course we could we can talk, text, send data files, and anything else you can pretty well imagine that, that's defined by roughly 10-ish. Uh, kilobits per second uh, around the world, and we can do it for many hours a day, even with one uh, GTO type high earth orbiting satellite that we get from reharvesting a, a, a geo satellite's uh, launch vehicle. Um, with six such satellites, which would be a goal, I guess. We have continuous global coverage, but depending on the inclination of the orbit, how it was, how its uh, orbit was inclined to the equator of the Earth, it uh, you may have better or worse polar coverage. Uh, obviously, higher inclination is providing better polar coverage. Um, we could determine the real uh, effects of rain and snow on links using these three bands and comparing them to one another anywhere in the world. 
Um, we could play with the link parameters to adapt to the rain conditions dynamically. We could implement power control loops or antenna gain control loops that would adjust the signal so that uh, uh, we could get every last uh, bit per second out of the link that uh, we, we could hope for. Um, we could in particular keep track of the differences between 24 and 47 gigahertz propagation on the satellites. The real question is, given the extra loss at 47 gigahertz, um, is that a deal killer for, for this band? And we can compare it to the 24 gig band, which is already uh, something we'll, we'll know uh, more. We'll learn more about 24 gigahertz before we ultimately learn more about 47 gigahertz, I think. So the idea would be to see if we can uh, uh, compare the two and uh, see, see if we can make 47 gigahertz as productive as, as is possible. Um, we should also use, uh, I'm, I'm not going to, I, th I think Michelle and others are going to talk about DBPS2 X a lot. So they'll tell you about the main features, but there is a mode called adaptive coding and modulation where we, we uh, every few milliseconds adjust the, uh, the modulation and coding scheme based on the link performance that the user receives on the ground. So the user would send a signal back to the spacecraft advising whether the signal was too strong or too, too weak. And based on that, the modulation coding scheme at the spacecraft could be changed. So we would think that all the users would be do, using that with their radio. Of course, there are many users sharing the satellite, so the satellite can't just change its mod cod step just because you would like it to because there's other people that it has to think about as well although it's not really thinking very much is it we could upload large files to spacecraft and use what i call a data cast mode so imagine you use one of the, one or several of these narrowband channels to upload a big really cool file that everybody in the in the world might like to see if there was such a thing uh we could store it on both uh, on board and then uh, download it via that wideband channel. And of course, it could be downloaded at what looks like eight or 900 kilobits per second in this example we've shown here. We could also arrange the configuration of the spacecraft to support different modes where you, you have 24 gigs up and 10.5 down, which would be the normal standard mode, you might say. But then these other modes could be possible. And that would include a 47, 47 up and down where you use some kind of time division multiplexing so you can turn off the transmitter when the receiver is receiving. But all those modes would be possible and they could be turned on at different times of the day or different days of the week as we've done on uh, the old Oscar spacecraft of, of the day. We used to do a lot of this kind of thing. So uh, this, this uh, uh, could be carried on at these uh, higher frequency bands. And if we get tired of satellites, we can always talk to our mates across town unless it rains too hard. <laughs> so here's a challenge for you. This, here's a 50 kilometer link. What we can see from the ITU rain model is that the path loss, well, you don't need the rain model. This is just one over R squared. The path loss on a 50 kilometer link would be about 160 dB at 47 gigahertz. And since uh, there'd be a lot of 47 gigahertz radios around now that we were talking to satellites, they might decide to uh, talk across the town or across county to their to their friends. And uh, this is uh, kind of what this looks like. So the, the challenge for you guys would be, what is the excess path loss across this 50 kilometer link? And uh, what size? Uh, is this the right size equipment to do the job? I suspect it's uh, more than you need. You can probably use a lot smaller antennas for such a short length. Anyway, thank you for listening to this and I hope it will inspire us to use these uh, frequency bands mightily into the future. <laughs>